The news that China signed a massive free trade deal with 15 Asia-Pacific nations confirms China is busy cutting a path forward even as much of the world is in economic turmoil due to COVID-19. This is a major victory in that it encompasses almost one-third of all global economic activity. It also gives the impression the United States is being left out in the cold. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, establishes the world's largest trading bloc. It was signed virtually during the annual summit of the Ten Nation Association of Southeast Asian Nations ASEAN. This underlines the fact that despite economic problems popping up in countries across the world, China is hellbent on pursuing its goal of galvanizing itself as the leading global power. Not waiting to resolve trade issues with America, China is busy turning economic lemons into lemonade. One example of China reaching out can be seen in its courting of Europe. Last year the European Union and China, after a series of meetings, came up with an important joint statement. It outlined agreement on three quite sensitive fronts and paved the way for a complex, wide-ranging EU-China investment deal. To put this in context, this came at a time when the German government had just cut its GDP forecast and the eurozone economy was slowing. The statement was signed by Chinese Premier Li Keqiang, European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker, and head of the European Council, Donald Tusk. This has been described as, the real deal, and is viewed as a departure from antics such as the endless Brexit saga. The agreement was free of any accusations of, unfair, trade hurled at Beijing. It appears that Brussels and Beijing seem to be finally engaging in building some sort of synergy between the One Belt One Road, OBOR, initiative. This is outlined in the EU Connecting Europe and Asia Project report. The president of the World Bank, David Malpass has claimed there is too much debt floating around the world and China is a big reason why. While his view could be written off as totally political, this is not the first indication that China has gone, shall we say, over the top in creating new credit. Last year the IMF has warned China of the risk having to do with increasing China's debt by agreeing to loans which could prove economically explosive. More and more of the debt over the last year has been related to and intricately interwoven into China's far-reaching and encompassing OBOR initiative. Malpass said, there are challenges facing the world in terms of how do you have transparent projects that are high quality, where the debt is transparent. China moved so fast that in some part of the world there is just too much debt. While at the IMF, Christine Lagarde the current head of the ECB raised these concerns and has made it clear that Beijing was fully aware of the potential potholes associated with such a massive undertaking as OBOR and underwriting its funding. The cost of the planned network to connect China with 68 countries and 4.4 billion people across Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Europe in a labyrinth of multi-trillion dollar transportation, energy, and telecommunications infrastructure projects may total as much as 8 trillion US dollars. Articles have appeared on this site over the years arguing that China is not our friend and its economy is predatory by nature. One such article explored how China was ramping up its fledgling aviation industry and how when it hits its stride we can expect cutthroat competition. The article warns that COMAC Commercial Aircraft Corp. of China claims its new twin-engine, narrow-body design of the C919 is superior to the Boeing 737 the best-selling jetliner in the world. COMAC also says it can bring the C919 in at a price lower than the $50 million range that Boeing and Airbus charge for each of their planes. If history is any indication, this industry will not grow organically but to be driven forward by an aggressive government with a mission. When China's aviation industry takes flight over the next few years America and Europe should expect to say goodbye to a huge chunk of exports in this field. Another issue addressed in past blogs is the merger of China's two largest companies involved in the production of railway locomotives, bullet trains, passenger trains, and metro vehicles. It pointed out that no effort was made to deny the impetus for the merger of China CNR Corp and CSR Corp in 2015 was the quest for a deeper push into overseas markets. Since the merger, China has been able to win by a wide margin nine-figure contracts, such as the supply of metro cars to Boston and LA. It should also be noted that CRRC formed a consortium with Bombardier which allowed it to compete for the renewal of the New York subways a huge contract that should amount to around $1.5 billion. Another article focused on America's trade deficit with Mexico. When following the money it becomes clear that money from the United States huge trade deficit with Mexico eventually ends up in China. 
When you start thinking about all the money and jobs we shift into Mexico each year you would think by now Mexico would be rolling in cash, however, a bit of research quickly confirms that the money Mexico receives by way of trading with America quickly passes through its lands and flows to Asia. It could be argued that when all is said and done we are still transferring our wealth to the Far East only by the scenic route and each year the numbers are huge. North Americans have been sending over half a trillion dollars a year to Asia each year. Emboldened by this influx of wealth China has played fast and loose with creating and loaning out new funds. As debt service rises, this can create serious balance of payment challenges. OBOR to move forward has to provide the financing for infrastructure that many countries desperately want and need but will they be able to repay the loans in coming years? The Center for Global Development, a Washington-based think tank, has highlighted in a report entitled Examining the Debt Implications of the Belt and Road Initiative from a Policy Perspective, the underlined the problems of extending credit to poor or unstable countries. It has pointed out that as many as 23 countries could be prone to debt distress. This group includes Pakistan, Djibouti, the Maldives, Laos, Mongolia, Montenegro, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan which were rated in the high-risk category. This brings us to the question of whether OBOR will become a massive expensive bridge to nowhere. While China has lent trillions of dollars to countries the motivation behind these loans must be questioned. Circling back to Malpass, it should be noted he has also criticized China for taking low-cost loans from the World Bank despite being the second-largest economy in the world, China even surpassed the bank's income threshold for low-cost loans in 2016. Malpass has also been critical of China's lending in conjunction with funding its OBOR infrastructure initiative claiming these loans can saddle weaker countries with excessive debt and low-quality projects. The bottom line is, China is our rival. China's state-run economy is based on a business model that is geared to expand by crushing the competition. China has no intention of being locked into producing low-end manufacturing of basic goods but is determined to move into high-tech products. China's plan centers around both state-owned and private firms investing in and acquiring foreign companies to steal their technological innovations. Subsidizing those companies working within its system in a multitude of ways helps China achieve this goal. Countries that export goods at slightly below cost in exchange for manufacturing jobs are not stupid they are predatory and America and the rest of the world are their prey. The EU too is taking the path of strengthening its ties to China in the hope it will spark an economic renaissance. The Eurozone was already in deep trouble before COVID-19 hit. Argue as you may but the bout of economic weakness that started in 2017 never ended. The latest scheme cooked up by Brussels seems more of its policy to extend and pretend all is well. The EU abandoned all structural reforms in 2014 when the ECB started its quantitative easing program QE, and expanded the balance sheet to record levels. Playing into Europe's problems is that in 2019, almost 22% of the Eurozone GDP gross added value came from travel and leisure, a sector that will unlikely come back anytime soon. To avoid the union coming apart at the seams the European Commission last year unveiled an unprecedented 750 billion euros COVID-19 recovery plan. It consisted of 500 billion euros in grants to member states and 250 billion euros in loans. This means those in Brussels are seeking a major extension of their power to where they can borrow money under the premise it will aid in ending the worst recession in European history and at the same time shore up Italy. This would result in transforming the EU's governing body in Brussels by allowing it to raise unprecedented sums on the capital markets to shore up hard-pressed EU countries. Roughly 80% of the Eurozone's real economy is financed by a banking sector that carries more than 600 billion euro in non-performing loans. Unemployment is also a problem, almost 30% of the Eurozone labor force is expected to be under some form of unemployment scheme for years. France, Spain, and Italy, with important rules and tax burdens on job creation, may suffer large unemployment for even longer. As of 2017, not a single European company ranked among the top 15 technology companies in the world and only four of the top 50 global technology companies are European. This is why skeptics are concerned that if the politically directed, Green New Deal, agenda doesn't boost growth or reduce debt the Eurozone will remain economically stagnate. The elephant in the room is that the Eurozone region simply isn't competitive. The EU lacks technological and intellectual property and is falling further behind the US and China. 
Germany, the region's manufacturing powerhouse continues to skirt along narrowly escaping recession while France, Spain, and Italy face years of large unemployment levels. It was clear that the EU was struggling in the spring of 2020 when the European Commission sharply revised lower its economic growth forecast for the area due to COVID-19. So far, the European Commission's expectations its economy would rapidly rebound have been dashed by a second wave of the pandemic. To generate the impression of hope the EU's leaders in Brussels are trying to pull a rabbit out of the hat by strengthening ties with China. The Guardian recently reported that China and the EU now appear to have resolved their differences over protecting labor rights in China and are set to sign a long-delayed investment agreement. This would strengthen ties between them and make the economies of the two blocs more interdependent. The investment talks address opening up Chinese markets for European investment, as well as addressing Chinese practices opposed by the EU concerning industrial subsidies, state control of enterprises, and forced technology transfers. A sticking point for the talks launched in 2013, has been the treatment of Uyghur Muslims, and the systematic suppression of free speech in Hong Kong. At the heart of these talks has been the EU's concern about these issues and how to enforce and arbitrate other parts of the agreement. It must be noted the same members of the European Parliament have in the recent past passed resolutions condemning the use of forced labor in China must ratify the agreement. Also, America and the incoming Biden administration are far from happy about the EU-China Comprehensive Investment Agreement which signifies a significant shift in EU policy towards Asia. The proposed deal dovetails with Beijing's One Belt, One Road, Obor initiative and follows the signing of an agreement made with Italy which is viewed by many as bankrupt. Last year, in what might be considered a bold move the Italian Prime Minister signed a historic memorandum of understanding with Chinese President Xi Jinping in Rome. The agreement made Italy the first founding EU member, and the first G7 nation, to officially sign on to Obor in hopes it would shore up its weak prospects. The ramifications flowing from Italy's deal with China may, in the end, prove to be a deal with the devil. The key motivation behind China working to reach a deal with poor, weak, but lovable Italy was its desire to exploit Italy and use it as a backdoor into the broader Eurozone market. The deal China and Italy Inc. contained development deals covering everything from port management, science and technology, e-commerce, and even soccer. The reality is that China is eager for control of entry points into the European Union that can be lawfully expanded upon. This does not bode well for the region. While in the past, Europe has enjoyed a trade surplus with America year after year this has not been the case when it comes to China. According to data from Eurostat, the EU had a 153 billion euro, 180.3 billion dollars, surplus with the US, meaning it exported more to the US than it imported, in 2019. The European Union is China's second largest trading partner but imports far more from China than it imports. These sort of numbers are not outliers but certification of a trend that has been growing for years. Simply put America has been carrying Europe on its back and the money and wealth that flows from America to Europe quickly finds its way to Asia. Below are the import and export figures with China from 2018 in billions of US dollars. United States, total trade 583.3 exports 429.7 imports 153.9 trade deficit 275.8. European Union, total trade 573.08 exports 375.1 imports 197.9 trade deficit 177.1. It could be argued Brussels is leading the EU into an ambush, Europe cannot hold its own against China. In the past, both the United States and the European Union have complained that China wants free trade without playing fair. To think China is a tiger that has suddenly changed its stripes borders on insanity. This treaty will not correct the market imbalance or give Europe the same level of market access or non-discriminatory environment investors seek. They will find this is not the first time that China signs such an agreement without respecting it. Europe which has seen its manufacturing sector debased by cheap knockoffs from China and other low-wage countries will find little comfort in bringing more of these goods into their market. It could be argued the Chinese system is geared to exploit. China's state-run economy is based on a predatory business model that is geared to expand by crushing the competition. China is determined to move into high-tech products and its plan centers around both state-owned and private firms investing in and acquiring foreign companies to steal their technological innovations. 
Subsidizing those companies working within its system in a multitude of ways helps China achieve this goal. This is not going to change. China exports goods at slightly below cost in order to draw manufacturing jobs from other countries. Those of us with such a view of China contend the move towards closer ties with China may hasten the demise of Europe. This has been a rinse and repeat lesson throughout human history. Country A is born, then grows and eventually becomes a superpower. The country A matures, then stagnates followed by a decline. Country B is born and follows the same path. It's basically a dissipative system. It will be no different for the USA and the same will eventually happen to China. This was the Nomad Economist. Please like. Share. Leave me a comment. Subscribe. And please take some time to subscribe to my backup channels, I do upload videos there too. You'll find the links in the description box. You will also find a PayPal link if you want to make a donation. Thank you wholeheartedly to all those of you who have already donated. Stay safe and healthy friends.